Greetings, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar. And our topic today is how to expertly evaluate ITSM tools for your organization. Our webinar is sponsored today by ISOS Technology Atlassian and my company, Star CIO. Uh, my name is Isaac Sokolik. I lead a company called Star CIO. I'm also an author of two books, Driving Digital and Digital Trailblazer that you see sitting behind me. Um, I spent a lot of my time working with organizations around Agile, DevOps, and a ton around ITSM. Um, I write for InfoWorld and CIO and speak at events yearly. I uh, just want to go through some housekeeping with everybody so you know um, how we're doing this today. We are recording uh, this episode, so uh, just be aware of that. Uh, that recording will be available after the webinar. So if you step away or miss a detail, uh, you'll be able to get access to that as well as sharing uh, the webinar recording with your colleagues and friends of interest. Uh, we will be answering questions as they come up when relative. So if you have a question, just throw it up in the, in the Q&A uh, area in Zoom. Uh, if it's relative to the conversation, I have the window open right in front of me. I will answer that that question right there and then. Uh, if not, we will have time at the end of the webinar uh, to be able to answer your questions. At this point, I would love uh, to invite my panelists to join me. Uh, first up is Andrew Bowman. Andrew's the Director of Strategic Accounts and Pre-Sales at ISOS Technology. Hello, Andrew. Tell us a, a few things about yourself and what you work on. Hello, Isaac, and thank you everyone for joining the webinar today. So I'm Andrew Bauman. I'm born, raised, and based in New York City. That's why I'm using my New York City background. Uh, and I've been part of the Atlassian ecosystem for eight years, doing a variety of different things, implementations, et cetera. But my specialty over the years has, you know, kind of become ITSM. And so I've helped a ton of my customers evaluate their tooling, decide what tool to pick based on the number of different criteria. And I also have several ITIL based, you know, specializations and certifications. So happy to be here today. Thank you. And thank you, Andrew. And our second guest, uh, Michael Santos. Thank you for joining us. Michael is a senior ITSM pre-sales solutions engineer over at Atlassian. Hello, Michael. Tell us about yourself. Uh, my name is Michael Santos. I'm a solution engineer at Atlassian. I've been working with various other ITSM solutions for the past 20 years. So my entire career has been service management, and I love helping my customers find some pain and then seeing what types of products we can use to solve that pain. Thanks, Michael. Looking at pain and opportunities, I just want to invite everybody who's on the webinar. We have three experts with you. Uh, one from Atlassian, a solution provider, one from ISOS, a partner in implementation, and myself, who's been implementing all kinds of IT processes, ITSM, Agile, and DevOps for 20 years. So you have three experts in the room. Take advantage of us. I want to start with a very simple question to start this off of, because we use this word service-oriented in a lot of different areas in IT and even outside IT. Um, so I want to just set the ground straight. You know, What does it mean to be service-oriented? Oriented, and how can leaders evaluate their current environments? Uh, Michael, where do you want to start with this? Yeah, I, I think the, the whole service-oriented side is more geared toward an organization's goals versus an individual uh, goal. So if a, you know, typically you think of help desk as the precursor to service desk, it's what's the problem with me, uh, not opposed, as opposed to what's going on with the service that maybe everybody is using at an organization. So uh, to me, it's an organization that is really focused on delivering service and that service could be anything to uh, an employee. Could be you know, putting in a request for an application or getting access uh, to some system that I never used before. Uh, and then from the the tracking side is that that's really what drives us to use an ITSM solution is to get the data back. So how do we track that info? Thank you, for Michael and Andrew. T tell me a little bit more about this. Is like a view from a customer's lens. You know, they're trying to get some work done. They're stuck with something. They have a request. Request. They may not even know the difference between an incident and a request, you know, and uh, so much of what we do is how do we fulfill it, but a lot of what ITIL V4 is talking about is how do we bring value back to our customers. Can we talk a little bit about that in terms of service orientation, value to Absolutely. customers and customers? 
Absolutely. The, and that's exactly how I think of service orientation when it comes to our implementations is, you know, ITIL talks a lot about this concept of value co-creation, which is you as maybe the service provider and your customer as the service consumer co-creating value today. And the easiest example I always go with is incident. And so making sure that your customer, the, you know, the value they're bringing might be the their day-to-day -day work responsibilities. And so in order to co-create value, you want to reduce as much as humanly possible the time it takes to restore their service after an incident. And so when you think about it from that lens, you should always be making incident management quicker and easier to be fulfilled because value is being lost as their service is being disrupted. Yeah, you know, what I think about there is I remember walking into one group and uh, doing an assessment and looking at their request form and it had maybe 25 fields on it. Uh, for every possible situation, onboarding, offboarding, something broken, an application not working properly. And the response I got from the team there uh, working on it in the, the service desk is that their, their tools were so hard to configure uh, that they needed to put the kitchen sink into their request forms. And uh, I said, well, you know, how many times are people coming to that form and not even filling it out, just inundated with too much information? So, you know, let's talk about this, Michael. You know, how do we make it easy for employees to ask requests and, and how should we measure it? Yeah, that's a, a great question. And I guess it goes back to what's successful or what is success to an organization? Is it happy customers? Is it less incidents? Is it faster time to provide a new service? You know, what, what does that look like? And uh, again, using the ITSM, ITIL, hey, I'm the service desk. What are the interaction points that we have for our end users? Is it going through a portal? Is it an email? Is it a 400 question form that we want the user to fill out? Uh, is it using Slack? Is it uh, walking by and saying, hey, I need help? You know, how do we capture all that stuff? And I think in my view is logging it is not a bad thing. It's a good thing because it lets us as uh, leaders say, okay, this is how we're performing. But also if we do need help. If we need more resources, we now have the data to back that up. Yeah, I mean, the, the the Slack piece is really interesting to me there, Michael. I mean, um, um, bringing the capability to where people are and the tools that they're using and not having them to figure out, okay, I have to go to this URL or this portal. Um, I'm right in my area of working and I could just click a button or open a window or say something and uh, get people's attention. I, I think that's so important, Andrew, because we think, you know, we still have this notion of service desk, the, the old Saturday Night Live skit, where there's like people just working on desktop support and so much more of service orientation hits, you know, I'm, you know, I'm doing those things, but I might have a problem with an application. I might need access to something. Um, there might be a third party service provider providing services around an ERP and another one providing services around your CRM. And in the last three years, maybe we've done some acquisitions and, you know, some people are on one platform and some providing services on another platform. How do we think about being service oriented when we have a little bit of technical debt behind us and we have complexity in how we're servicing customers? And I, and I love the way you, to paraphrase what you said about meeting people where they are, to give you an example of, of a customer that we worked with recently, not only were they deploying Jira service management for an IT help desk, they had an HR component, and they also had, like you were mentioning, a third party provider actually working on some of those tickets too. And in the back end, it was a lot of automation and integration with the third party providers tooling. So everyone got their right tickets, but on the front end, Again, you're kind of you need to meet your customer where they are. And so they're not going to have any idea if this is going to HR or IT or this third party provider. And so when we set up the portal, we use the kind of a, the simple search bar in, in the, the front of the page to help guide them to the particular request. You know, if they put in that they needed benefits help, it would take them to HR versus if they needed a particular type of application support that might go to that third party provider or not. The customer had no idea. So again, making it simple for them, meeting them where they are but then also handling it in the back end appropriately. Super. So, we, you know, today we're talking about how to expertly evaluate your ITSM tools. And we're talking a pretty wide scope of how ITSM tools are used today. Uh, I think we're ready for our first poll. 
uh, we're sort of interested uh, in your vantage point, the tools that you're using at your organization. I find most organizations are clicking more than one box here. So we made this a multiple choice, select as many as apply. I think that's how this is configured. Um, some of these tools have been around a very long time. Uh, and uh, there's some not even here that I remember from my days being back in CIO that platform X was superseding platform Y. Uh, so a lot of change in this space. It's because of what we just talked about, right? A lot of new capabilities, new ways of integrating workflow, new automations. And we're going to talk all about this. So let's just see where this poll netted out. Okay, so we got we got a fan base here, 12 out of 14 uh, on, on Atlassian. And then we see some service now and some others. Uh, welcome Atlassian fans. We're gonna to to be talking a lot about how to use this tool and how to continue to evolve your uh, service management processes. Uh, if you're using service now, we're gonna talk about where you can get benefit from being on an Atlassian tool, but also thinking about that federated model, right? Not all, that federated model where I probably have other service providers. I was working with a client yesterday. They're on a platform and they're using a service provider that's using something else. And how do we connect the dots and make sure we have a, a closed loop system around this? That really gets into this question of how are we using our tools? Right? How are we using our service management tools? And when I ask groups around this, I'm typically getting responses in your sort of, you know, your early entry um, areas, your, your easier areas. I got tickets to open up. Some of them are incident and some of them are requests. And then it bifurcates, right? Uh, we have lots of different areas that different groups go into depending on their problem and focus areas. Andrew, take us through this maturity model a little bit. Absolutely. So this maturity model was something we developed at ISOs over the course of, you know, a period of time where we met with a bunch of our ITSM, ITIL experts across the different departments and tried to logically group the most logically connected ITIL and ITSM processes. And I'll give you two different examples of how we use this with our customers. And actually, both examples are for the same customer. And so we were working with a sportswear manufacturer and they were looking to move their tooling. And so when we sat down with them, we said, okay, using this maturity model, we can help them kind of put the blinders on a little bit and focus on only the important, the you know, the stuff that they're either doing well or they need to keep doing in, as they're moving tools in order to prevent any service disruption. And so they ended up in the one area. And that's really in the interest of not boiling the ocean. Don't take on more than you can chew in a situation where you're switching your tooling. But if you're more in the situation where you're staying on your tooling, you're just evaluating how you use it and you're looking at your processes, it could make sense to jump up an area. And so for them, after we went live with number one, which is incident change, kind of all the basics, they went up to number two. And so that was actually the second project, which was basic asset management, basic major incident event management. And so this is just kind of a utility for us to help customers along their journey based on all of our learnings across the last several years of implementing enterprise solutions, enterprise ITSM solutions specifically. Yeah, I mean, what I love about this is that uh, if, if I asked people, you know, where do they focus on beyond the basics, you get different answers. Um, it's, you know, maturity helps you get a sense of, um, what's involved in getting this implemented. And as you go down this list, some of them get become more complicated, but they don't have to be. I mean, if you take change management, I have one client, for example, uh, that client does not have a change management process. You don't know what's been deployed. Um, you don't know who's walking into their data center. They just needed something really, really basics to start. If you're going to do something on a system of record or a production system, let us at least capture who did what where. Very simple process. And another group that was really mature with the process, they had cab boards for every single release, every single deployment. And their request back to me was, well, how do we simplify this so that we still have our change record, 
but for low risk changes, we can do this in a more automated, seamless fashion, um, not get people in a room talking about small changes to websites and being able to deploy more seamlessly. And uh, Michael's gonna talk to us a lot about automations, but we used a lot of automations in the Atlassian platform to say, you know, here's the questions you ask, and if it's deemed low risk, it can get a pre-approval or maybe only a specific person has to be involved in pre-approval. So that's my favorite one around this. Andrew, what are you seeing out there in terms of what you're working with clients on uh, around these different areas. Yeah, my, my favorite example, similar to change or very related to change is asset management. And, you know, my phrase on the webinar is going to become don't boil the ocean. I have so many customers who come to us and they say, oh, we want to implement good asset management. We want to track every CI we have and they don't have anything. And so that's why the, the maturity model kind of breaks it out to inventory management, asset management, cloud and software discovery, service discovery. You know, you kind of want to pick, especially again, if you're starting from scratch or what you have isn't useful, you want to pick something to start small. And so it might be you have a significant AWS infrastructure that you want to start tracking and maybe the on-prem assets aren't valuable. You can start there and then take that next step after you implement. So kind of starting slow with asset management is my favorite advice we give the customers because then you see a lot of returns later and down the line. I like this notion of starting small, but I also, what you're, I really like what you're saying is that ITSM doesn't live in its own island, right? It's going to be connecting to other tools. I want to be able to do discovery uh, around my cloud environment if I'm doing asset management. I'm going to have to connect to other tools if I'm doing, uh, you know, uh, if I'm putting people on call, if I'm responding to things. So ITSM is a workflow engine. It's got some inputs to it. It has some things that you need to connect to. Um, what else are you seeing around this idea of a complete ecosystem for IT to be able to manage services, but also do the other work that they're doing on a day-to-day -day basis? And so that, that, that question lets me go right back to that sportswear manufacturer, because as they were moving off of their previous tool, the JIRA, one of the big benefits for them were event management, but in the interest of ITSM not being an island, one of the biggest benefits was connecting to their agile and application support teams. And so they picked JIRA for multiple reasons, but their number one was getting onto the tooling that those app support teams were using as well. And so what we were able to do was create this system where specific events could trigger app support who were using JIRA software-based boards and you know Kanban boards, et cetera. And that, that, again, to an earlier point I made, helped them reduce kind of restoration time, which was a huge win for them immediately after going live with event management. Yeah, I mean, I, I think about, uh, you know, how hard it was to do closed loop processes. Uh, just five or 10 years ago, I, mean, I wrote about it in my first book, uh, where you have agile teams we're trying to do as much as we can to push features out to address technical debt. And my operations teams, they're handling incidents, they're getting questions thrown at them that look like defects. And now I need to think about how do I route that information to the right team? How do I express the right level of urgency is around this um, so that we don't send dev teams chasing every single issue that comes up. They can actually prioritize, they can triage what's coming in. And then when they actually... Um, resolve an issue, right? Either through answering a question or maybe even doing a release around something. You know, how do we close loop back into uh, into the ITSM world, knowing that this ticket was closed or this issue was resolved? Um, it's connected to this change process, and we know how to get back to our customers again about that uh, change. Michael, how do we do this? Right? We could do that. You know, what's the missing ingredient that makes this possible? Yeah, one of my favorite topics is automation. You, you kind of hit that at the beginning because I used to work a service desk and I hated mundane tasks. I hated having to swivel chair to something else. Uh, I hated having to manually do something. So one of the first things I ever did was automate simple responses. If I didn't want to have to ping a customer, hey, did that work for you? Because I could go focus on answering my phone calls that are back backed up or uh, answer things that are coming in through the portal. So automation for me is big because it frees up our resources to really focus on that service delivery. Because again, ITSM is really what IT does. It's service to the end user and making them happy and not constantly complaining that we're not doing things. And if that allows us to then say, okay, yes, we intake your request. We then 
jump it over to development that's using Jira software to then roll out code changes and using Bitbucket and then coming back to the service request and letting us know it's been done or maybe tying it to change management to get approval before we do it. It saves a lot of time and effort and makes us uh, really provide, again, to Andrew's point, more value back uh, to the organization. Right, so, so you know, ITSM is not on its island. Our workflow is gonna connect across departments. It's gonna connect across systems. I even think about things like connecting to customer support system. You know, an actual customer, paying customer is calling up your customer support line, having an issue. And it turns out that customer support now has to escalate this as an IT issue. IT resolves the issue. And now we need to close back and, and being able to close that issue out with an actual customer. Uh, one part of this is automation, right? How do we know this is working, uh, Andrew? You know, that where we need to do some process improvement. What are we so using the, to do that? So this is my favorite topic to steal Michael's intro, um, but it's KPIs. And one of the reasons it's my favorite topic is related to the overall, you know, goal of the webinar about evaluating your ITSM tooling. If you're considering a move, you should be tracking those KPIs now. And so even if you think you're doing a bad job, right? Some, you know, the, you've got your basic statistics like created versus resolved or resolution time or some more advanced statistics like successful change percent, alert resolution time. You know, if you're trying to prove that your influence has improved those process areas by moving to a new tool, revitalizing those processes, making them more efficient, you should be tracking those KPIs now so six months down the line, you can show that improvement directly to those KPIs you picked with your executive team. Super, I mean, so there's a lot to this because even when I think about KPIs, I think about what my priorities are, right? What are my short-term priorities? If you're very customer focused, I'm gonna be thinking about um, how do we ensure that we're closing out issues properly? You know, are they closed out quickly? Is there a, a good customer satisfaction score going on around them? If I've met that objective over six to nine months, we're sort of seeing that increment um, and plateau. Now I'm thinking about operational efficiency. What percentage of incidents and requests coming in are being resolved by frontline support? And maybe what percent are being done by self-service and what percent is being done uh, by uh, automation or what percent we have to go to level two or DevOps teams. So now I'm getting into an operational efficiency. So when I think about, you know, how do we expertly evaluate, can it continue to take me down a journey, right? The journey of more things I want to provide services on, more maturity around my services, and then ultimately more value. Uh, I think that's going to get to our second poll here. I think this will be useful for everybody here to see what your peers are thinking about, uh, what benefits of ITSM are important to the organization over the next 12 months. Uh, and that's very key to me. I know we live in organizations that try to prioritize everything. Um, and uh, what we find out is trying to do too much of everything ends up with too little of nothing. Um, so let's talk about what you're really focused on as an organization. We put up a bunch of these. Wouldn't surprise me if many of you have one or two of these um, on the forefront uh, and uh, looking excited to see what you guys come back with. So uh, uh, let's keep that poll open a few more seconds and then we'll see what, uh, what our response is. Okay, let's bring our response up and see what we ended up with. I am not surprised by this. Um, Andrew, I don't know how you feel about this. I'm gonna give you a chance to comment on this, but we've got what I call a sort of peanut butter spread, right? And we're talking Absolutely. about op efficiency and uh, reduced costs and spending is the top two. Um, I think that's kind of part of where our industry is at right now. You know, there's been some companies with um, experiencing layoffs. There's been um, talk or depending on your industry, an actual recession. Um, and we're trying to just do more with less. I, I don't know what you're think, seeing, but I'm seeing that. And that means helping your workflow and your tools work for you, right? How do you become more efficient because you're doing automation or because you have better information on what you're prioritizing? What are you seeing in here? Yeah, the, the exact same answer. You know, and I'm, I'm 
I'm not surprised by the peanut butter spread, but I'm also not surprised that that operational efficiency um, answer is number one, because I think that's the trend we're seeing more often than not. Sure, we have a handful of customers who are just reducing budgets flat, but it's more about, okay, we've got what we've got and how do we make it more efficient and get quicker with more automation and integrations, et cetera. So that improving that efficiency is exactly what we're seeing out of a ton of our customers nowadays. Very cool. So let's let's shift to the next area where we talked about um, ITSM and we're going to get now into the evaluating. How do we research ITSM tools? It's a pretty mature space. I mean, it's just not like a new thing that we've had service and help desks. I think the scope has expanded. Um, certainly the um, experience that we are trying to deliver to customers that has changed a lot. Certainly the automation has changed a lot over the last few years. Uh, the ability to scale and handle some of the problems I talked about, you know, servicing multiple tickets uh, across different systems, that's changed a lot over the last few years. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of interested in your do's and don'ts, right? Lots of tools out there, mature space, you know, how do we go from we recognize we can do better than what we have. We want to move off of legacy platforms and look at some things that are going to be a little bit for for uh, for looking. So, Michael, share with me a don't. What are some things that we don't do when we're researching platforms? Yeah, uh, it is not a mature. Uh, it's a very mature space because again, I've been in it twenty years, so I've I've seen some very cringy things that have happened. And the big one is always focusing on uh, a replacement to do the same exact thing that you've been doing before, whether it's three, five, seven years down the, uh, from prior. And just because you were doing it one way back then doesn't mean that it's still applicable now. And it's, it's looking toward the future. So I think uh, a lot of our customers get in that um, mindset of, okay, let's build a feature spreadsheet of what we're doing today, how it's exactly done in the tool, but not uh, that we're using and not open up to what we could be doing or where we want to be in the future. Uh, and then it also goes to the users who's driving the, the change. Are they the ones that's then influencing, well, what do we need in a tool right now versus what we could be using in the future? I hear you. Like I hear it all the time. We are an X shop. And, you know, the door is just shut closed. We're not even going to listen or look at what's out there. And, you know, I know a lot of you said you're using Atlassian tools. Atlassian's got a wide range of tools. I've also heard, you know, we're using Jira software, but we're not going to go look at Jira service management because we have X involved. Uh, and so now I want to spearhead this conversation, Andrew, right? I want to get people interested in looking outside of the box that we're living in. Um, how do we do that efficiently? So I'll tell you, it's definitely not by creating a spreadsheet with a thousand rows in it and evaluating every feature. And so that's my big don't. It's analysis paralysis, right? You go back to the maturity model, you focus on what's important, right? And you were the one who said it after I mentioned KPIs, focus on what matters and evaluate those features specifically. And I want you to create a roadmap, right? We do it all the time with our customers in the beginning. And I want you to evaluate those features but don't create that spreadsheet, right? You want to move quickly. You want to see the value of your project and your implementation. If you're moving off a tool, don't waste six months evaluating every single little thing a tool could do. Yeah, I just gave a, a client that same advice yesterday, um, trying to figure out what's really important. Again, looking at the next 12 months, how do you test and evaluate your heading in the direction that's going to make you more efficient or take cost out? Uh, what about some do's in here? Michael, you know, we talked about making some decisions faster. How do we do that? What's the lens we should use to do that? Yeah, I break that into two areas. One is understand what, where the organization wants to go. Uh, and then also who the users are, whether that's end users or business users or whoever, um, making sure that we don't design in a vacuum. We don't, we don't look for a tool in a vacuum. Uh, I always used to talk about when I would present for tool replacements of a, a customer who had an old Lotus Notes uh, database that they used as their service management tool. And that's how old this was. And But their user population was very used to it. So what they decided to do is like, oh, we have all these nice shiny bells and whistles. Let's just roll it out. Don't ask anybody about it. It's we're our own mind in, in IT saying this is what it should be. The portal adoption was horrendous. Uh, they dropped because users didn't know the terminology. Uh, they didn't um, uh, understand what they're supposed to click on. To Andrew's point where, hey, you had that 
big search box where you just typed in something and it would guide you, that didn't exist. So I think a good do is to get involved with the users, do design workshops, pull your users to see what they're doing, or maybe if here, uh, I've been on a couple um, uh, scenarios before where they give different designs, hey, pick which ones you like the best and why, and then you can kind of maybe collaborate and, and build a better solution going forward. Yeah, so I think where this is going to take me, you know, going back to what I said earlier, we're not going to create one giant form to service everybody in our organization because we know that doesn't work. We have different departments with different needs in terms of what they're going to request, what's the most likely thing they're going to answer. We, I know some organizations, they offer a VIP white glove service, very different way of handling it than your employees and, and maybe even field employees are handled differently. So my scale just got bigger. Right, I'm doing trying to do a ton of more stuff with my ITSM tools. How do I do this, Andrew? I mean, it, it, I, I just doubled the scope, but I'm trying to get more efficient. It, and so, when you're evaluating your tools, one of the biggest things should be evaluating how quickly and easily it is to create those automations to support those different levels of end users. Right? I'll, I'll give you an example from my past. You know, eight years ago, I used to work on a a piece of software in the ITSM space that required three full-time, you know, employees just to keep it running, D DBA, networking, et cetera. You're not going to be able to dedicate and take look at the poll. You're not going to be able to dedicate time to improving your efficiency if number one, you're spending all the money just keeping the software running. And number two, it takes forever to even build those automations. So one of the biggest pieces of advice I can give you in a do is don't forget about that. Don't forget that you want to continue to improve the efficiencies of your processes and your automations and evaluate how long it takes to do those kind of things in your tool selection. Got it. So let's go one level deeper around this. Let's talk about and capture and discuss what people are actually trying to do. You know, going back to your 16, I keep making up that number. I don't know how many rows you have in your maturity model. I didn't count it, but there's a lot of areas and there's areas in there that we didn't even capture. I mean, I know some groups using Jira service management to work with HR on their request management processes. So a lot of enterprises are looking at it very broadly. So let's look, let's do our third poll. Let's go beyond basic request and incident management, change management, the basics. We know we have kind of a Chinese menu of where we're gonna to go to. Kind of interested in what your focus is and you got a multiple choice here, but I'm gonna ask you to do the same thing. Prioritize me, right? Tell me what the next couple things that you think your organization should focus on, um, that you're going to use your basis of looking at solutions or you do a basis of doing a POC around this because love to hear uh, where people are thinking as you're trying to take cost out or become more efficient or become more collaborative, where, where are you focused on? So let's leave this open a little bit. Um, we're not going to take a final four answer around this. It's just too hard to predict on this one. And uh, when you think we have consensus, let's bring this up. There's a bunch of choices here. So it might take a people a few more minutes uh, to read through this. Um, I know I have some favorites on here, but I'm wondering if they're going to come up. All right, let's close the poll out and see where we're at on this. Wow. Uh, I was gunning uh, for self-service and I was gunning for request automation, right? And I, I think these are the capabilities that when you can talk about it with your user base um, and demonstrate that they can do things on their own, um, the last thing I want is to have to open tickets and wait for things. So when I can do that, um, or when part of those tickets are now more efficient because in IT we've automated the steps. So instead of handoff, I have to handoff, I have to handoff, I can do something that's common, click on those three steps, it's now automated. I'm really psyched to see that these are the top two. Michael, any surprises you see here? No, I'm, I'm happy to see the service request automation. I think that goes hand in hand with the uh, self-service. You know, again, if we can automate our end users doing things on their own, more power to us because then frees us up to do other things. Excellent. So let's talk about the next step, right? Next step, we're thinking about um, evaluating some technologies. I'm hoping that you can get it down to a short list. Look at what you have today. Look at what Atlassian offers. Narrow it down to a couple of different areas 
And now we want to avoid what um, Andrew is afraid of. How do we avoid analysis paralysis? And I could tell you, you know, going back to Andrew's answer about, you know, how easy it is to do things. They very often will open up an Atlassian tool and show people how easy it is to set up a first automation or how to change a workflow for a specific uh, department that needs something slightly different. Um, so I, th I think the results are in the user interface and the tools that they're providing you. But what we just talked about right before we started, being able to find documentation to give you answers, being able to find experts to give you answers. These are some of the things um, that I look for in looking for what I consider truly digital technologies today. Michael, what do you look for? What? How do we gain consensus on a tool like um, Jira Service Management and, and uh, upgrade to our ITSM? Yeah, I think it's not getting so focused on a short list uh, because that may put some blinders on that we may go down a, a, a rabbit hole that we don't want to go down. So maybe if get out of the mindset of thinking, oh, we did this before at this other company I was at, so we should only look at these vendors going forward uh, because you know, we don't want to limit ourselves. You know, if we're so focused on uh, optimizing our whatever that the poll had on, on the all those options, you know, is that where we want to be in two years? And you know, we don't want to redo another re-implementation in two, three, four years uh, just because we discounted, uh, oh, we're not mature enough for this solution at this time period. Um, I've seen, you know, if you look at the Gartner Magic Quadrants, there's a lot of tool sets in here, but you see which ones are bubbling up as the leaders. They usually start at that point, but that doesn't mean that, hey, one of those leaders is better than the other right now we got to look at where we're going in the future right so let's not look at a thousand lines in a spreadsheet let's start with our short term but also let's not forget our long term where we're trying to right. get there uh what's our vision around this how do we connect the dots andrew it easy you create a roadmap and now i'm finally the one in the webinar talking about boiling the ocean because one of my favorite tricks in one of these tool evaluations is pretty simple it's you, you focus on exactly as Michael said, what's your short-term vision, but you're going to have people who want that longer-term vision. They want, you know, asset, sophisticated asset discovery, sophisticated event management. And so when you, when we work with customers, we'll actually literally create a two, three-year roadmap that shows how they're going to get there. And that'll help you deal with those stakeholders who are trying to push their priority. It's a lot easier to tell them, we know your priorities are important, we'll get there, as opposed to telling them it's not on the roadmap at all. So actually creating that two to three year roadmap will help you with gaining consensus. Yeah, I love that too. And, I, and what I also would suggest around this is sometimes when I hear something is midterm, right? Maybe it's not in the six to 12 month plan, but we better be able to do that in 12 to 24 months. I love looking again, through the Atlassian documentation, through the marketplace, right? If I can find three or four options in the marketplace to go do something, maybe I don't need to invest time into researching all of them, but I know I have three or four options to go look at. So a lot of different ways of doing this. Uh, most important for me is around the skill sets, right? We know there's a lot of technology capabilities today, but I need a partner to help me. I need my IT team to help me. I want a lot of different ways to service what I'm working on uh, so that if it's something small, like a change to the workflow, maybe I can do that ourselves. If it's something a little bit larger, like I want to get into some more advanced reporting, I want somebody who can help my team guide on that implementation. If I'm doing something even bigger than that, I'm connecting a workflow with a service provider who has their own system, and I want to make sure there's a closed loop process with the right KPI reporting at this, maybe I need need help implementation with the implementation. So uh, I'm a very big, strong fan of partnering, uh, bring uh, uh, somebody in who can help me with this. So how do we get past, um, you know, a tool can get me part of the way there. I want to be able to do it myself in certain areas. I want to be able to do some implementation, but I also want to have a partner around this. Mike, well, tell me a little bit more uh, you know, I go onto the Atlassian website. I hear things like Atlassian part platinum partner. What does that mean? Yeah. So um, just on the, the top level, like I love working with partners yeah, because as much as I may know about a solution or have, um, if I'm a customer trying to implement a solution, I like to do things on my own, but I don't know everything. I don't know what worked for somebody in my same industry. So having a partner like ISOs to guide me or say, oh yeah, well, we saw another customer that did X, Y, and Z in your same area. 
but they were more successful doing A, B, and C instead. So having that knowledge of what works and what may not work uh, is invaluable. And uh, Elastin is very much partner-centric. Uh, we have very uh, four different types of partners, um, solution partners, marketplace partners, and the like. And the solution partners are the, the key ones, like ISOs. You know, we have different tier levels. And ISOs being a platinum uh, provider, of, of, it really can run the gamut of very small things to very large things. So you know that with a platinum level partner, you're going to get you know, top level uh, capabilities, top level implementation assistance. Um, and then of course, the ability to look at, hey, are those marketplace apps, which ones work best for you? So uh, to me, partners are invaluable for any organization um, and having somebody like ISOs to be able to provide the expertise is invaluable. I want to remind everybody, we are taking questions and we're through more than 50% of our webinars. So if you've had a question looming in your mind, please go into the question and answer box, key it in. We'd love to help you with a tactical problem, a strategic problem, an idea. We're here to help. Andrew, uh, you know, I think about the implementations that I sometimes walk in. This is across all technologies you can see you pick the technology and it's taking 18 months to implement so i'm always looking for a partner who has going to help me on ramp is going to let me migrate over to something tell me some of the areas that isos helps customers with uh with their programs around uh, J uh jira service management one of the biggest one of our biggest specialties is the first all process right you come to isos and you're not just getting someone who knows Jira like the back of their hand because they do, but they've also been there, done that. We've done a ton of ITSM implementations over the years and they'll know good process recommendations to make. And that's one of the biggest questions we get all the time is, hey, what are other customers doing? How are they doing incident management? How are they doing change? We're bringing that with our engineering team. The, our ITSM specific practice has over 13 years on average, almost half of them are ITIL V4 certified or better, you know, specialist level. So you're getting that good process knowledge, that good implementation knowledge. And, and again, we've done it before. So we've moved off of almost every single tool under the sun. So we know how to do it. We know how to train you on it as well, how to equate terms that you might be used to in your previous tool to what works in JIRA. And that's kind of the expertise we're bringing, as opposed to you doing it yourself, where there might be pitfalls you didn't know about, but we know about them because we help customers move past them all the time. You know, one of the things I hear a lot about, help, help me out with this, is that uh, um, more organizations are doing a lot more with their technology than they've ever been before. And so, you know, when we think about what IT is responding, we're, IT, we're responding with our standard service offering. What does the enterprise require? But when I work with hospitals, when I work with government, um, there's one group, at least one group, that's 24 by 7, right? There's one group that's, I want to provide white glove treatment. How do we think about that when I'm working with a partner? And that's one of the other areas of expertise we bring is not just focused in on ITSM or ITIL, but it's that vertical experience, right? We've done those implementations for hospitals. Actually, my first ITSM implementation when I got out of college was for a hospital up in Boston. And nice. not only that, but also government, higher ed, et cetera. And so dealing with those use cases, right? You know, we did an implementation recently for a hedge fund. And so dealing with that, that kind of the situation where those guys were trading all the time and they couldn't, you know, they weren't going to a portal and spending 30 minutes searching for a request, making sure that for their use case, we were meeting their customers where they are was important to them. And being able to tell that specific hedge fund that we had worked in finance a bunch really resonated. And so depending on where you are, knowing we can bring those examples, again, it's just helping you make sure you set yourself up for success. Andrew, we used a word uh, before called co-creation. It's a, a word I used in a, a blog post recently to explain to folks how to think about working with partners. And, you know, there's a couple of use cases that I think about ISOs around here. I, I think about that DevOps use case we talked about before. What are my options when I need to connect an agile team to a set of SREs, to a set of um, ITSM folks um, handling problems? Um, I think about connecting the support I'm providing in-house with the support a vendor is providing around a partner. And I think a lot about when I do uh, migrations, a lot of that is M&A oriented. Somebody's on tool X, 
you know, they have certain services built into it. They're organized in a certain way. I'm looking for options, right? How do you think about um, handling these different situations so that you are co-creating? The When we like to look at it, especially in those more complicated scenarios, we're always sitting the customer down and giving those them those options up front, right? My what, is, what I like to teach from a analysis architecture perspective is you've got to understand the customer where they are, where, what they're trying to achieve from integrating all these different use cases together. You've got to give them a couple of different examples of how it could work. And then you give them that recommendation. You say, what I've seen work before is this, but the, here are some other options for us to consider too. You're, you hit the nail on the head. It's about, not only is it about you co-creating value internally with all your different stakeholders, but it's us co-creating value with you, right? We want to make sure that we're we're giving you good recommendations that will work for your organization. We also want to give you options so you can kind of consider, okay, maybe I use an integration with a third-party integration tool, or I do it with like a Python script, and we'll walk you through those examples and decide together how we move forward to solve your problems. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Michael. I want to remind everybody, uh, send us your questions. We're almost at the Q&A area. Uh, I do want to summarize some of the key points uh, that we left with you. Uh, number one, focus your review around the short term. Uh, what do you need to do or what are your opportunities over the next 12 months? But like Andrew and Michael said, think long term, have a long term vision and build a roadmap out around that. Um, look at the maturity model. There's a lot of different things that groups focus on there. But again, pick the two or three areas that are going to deliver the most value and really execute them um, from an early stage perspective. How do we get that capability out? And then how do we mature that particular capability going forward? And then lastly, you know, there's some things I really want teams to be self-sufficient on in terms of being able to do things themselves, make quick changes. But I know we support a lot of different technologies and tools in IT today being able to co-create with a partner when I'm doing something that we've never done before. Uh, and that's the number one reason I'm looking for long-term partnerships. I've also left with you here in the summary, uh, there's a blog post I wrote for ISOs a few weeks ago, um, eight reasons it's time to sunset your legacy ITSM tool. You should see the link in your chat window. And I share with you four here. Here are the things that you know uh, it's time to really start looking beyond legacy. Uh, employees and opening tickets uh, avoiding them at all costs. Um, I shared a story earlier today with a group. Um, the tickets aren't coming in because they're calling people up and they're hanging up. They're put, they're not putting uh, they're not leaving a voicemail and the ticket is never showing up in their ITSM tool because they don't have that integration involved. Uh, too many clicks to manage a ticket. All right, that's a sign that you're probably have an opportunity to automate more. It lacks a mobile interface, right? Maybe we could have gotten away with that the last few years during the pandemic, but most people are remote, working remotely on travel, want to be able to make sure they can do requests while they're on the road, um, and then the inability to create self-service options, right? When I go to the portal, uh, I wanna hear what the person's problem is, but I also wanna educate them, hey, you can go uh, uh, fill out an extra form, a very customized form, three questions, and you can actually service a problem yourself. So I leave you four more in that blog post. Um, I hope that you will join uh, and review them. Uh, ISOS also has a white paper that I hope you will review, uh, a modern ITSM solution for an evolving IT landscape. So if you didn't get enough of it from here, um, I hope you'll download that white paper from ISOS. It's at the URL, isostech.com slash JSM dash white paper. And uh, Andrew, you've been telling me about this, this workshop that you do in ITIL. Uh, please tell everybody about this. Yeah, and so for everyone attending the webinar today, we're offering a complimentary ITIL workshop. The idea behind it is you bring the process that you feel you need the most advice on. So that might be incident or change enablement, and you're getting that ITIL V4 specialist I was talking about a little bit earlier in the webinar to sit with you and go over it and give you some recommendations on how you can improve. It doesn't have to be JIRA specific. I know most of you use JIRA, but if you're using ServiceNow or anything else, we're analyzing your process. So we'll get a little bit into the tool if that's where you want to go. But the most successful ITIL workshops we'll do will actually have more Visio type diagrams where we're going through the process step by step and not just giving you recommendations, but we're also giving you ad advice on, on how to improve and make them more efficient. In addition to this, 
we're also going to be a we're going to have a huge presence at the Atlassian team event in April. So if you are there, please stop by. If you don't know what that is, that's Atlassian's big yearly conference. There's going to be a ton of great new product announcements, especially around JSM. If you are not going, our next webinar in this series will be a recap webinar. So feel free to join that next time in May in order to get those product recommendations or product announcements that Atlassian's going to be making at the event. Thank you, uh, Andrew and Michael. Again, we're up to our Q&A. I'm going to pick this question that just came, just came in. Um, it talks about uh, customer has hundreds of locations across the globe, um, is using 1,500 JSM agent licenses and 1,500 confluence licenses. Um, he says, or uh, yes, it's a he. He says that uh, he's solved this problem. Um, his goal is to significantly reduce the number of JSM licenses and Confluence licenses and improve productivity. He's, looked, he's done some work around this already. Uh, faced with this problem, Andrew, this challenge, you know, how do you consolidate? How do you help the group get more efficient and working across different locations? I think that has a nuance to it also. Uh, what are some of the things you would think about or ask about, Andrew, um, to help um, this individual out? Yeah, I looking at the the problem statement here which is basically just around reducing licenses the easiest route to go down is a license analysis or license workshop which isos actually provides complementary as well that'll let us just go through the number of people and kind of what are they actually contributing some of the things that come to mind immediately is not everyone needs to be licensed for confluence in order to read um, articles and similarly with jsm People don't have to be licensed for JSM as well to work tickets. If they're more of a collaborator, they can consume a Jira software license instead. So that's where my head is going and in, in initially kind of around looking at the different roles and seeing if either a no license scenario could work in a confluence or a different type of license such as a Jira software license uh, would work for JSM. But this is also obviously a scenario where I'd suggest to the individual to reach out. I'd love to kind of talk about this problem more in depth and figure out a, you know different answers that might work. Andrew, I think the other issue I see with this is they might have 100 locations and 20, 30 different instances bought by different people for different use cases. Um, and there's potentially an opportunity to consolidate. How do you help with that? And what's the opportunity there? And so that's a, that is a type of project that we do constantly. And so what we, we have an entire engineering team whose focus is those consolidations and migrations. And so in situations, number one, to talk again about those licensing, Atlassian just provides a licensing model that lets you combine those tenants under the same organization, right? So that might be an instant savings if people are duplicatively licensed. But the number two, if you have to go with a more technical and process combination where everyone joins on one tenant, again, that's not only something that we do all the time, but we have tons of different playbooks and scenarios that makes it really quick and efficient for us to merge those sites together. I think another use case I see around this is like of the 20 different instances, seven of them are on prem, not on cloud, on outdated versions. And of the ones that are in the cloud, maybe there's an opportunity to integrate with their single sign on technologies never done before. Are these things that you're doing on a regular basis? All the time, especially with as we move more to a, a SaaS type, you know, a SaaS first culture, probably we're already there, right? So a lot of organizations are coming to us and asking us to help them move to Atlassian SaaS based product. Uh, there's a million dollar question here. I think we have to answer this, Michael. There's a question here about how does Jira service management differentiate from ServiceNow, right? I'm sure they're coming out with their latest and greatest too. So how do we think about this differently than maybe the comparisons that we used to do four or five years ago? Yeah, I mean, ServiceNow is the, the big uh, gorilla in the room. Uh, everybody's always comparing to them or they're using them now. And really, JSM is the, the core is the platform. Uh, Jira Cloud runs Jira software, and it has native integrations to a lot of Atlassian tool sets that many organizations already use today. So being able to leverage and invest in the existing Atlassian investment is is bar none the, the best thing that you can do. Uh, to go back to that previous question, you know, I don't want to hear that you want to use less licenses, but that's a good opportunity to say, how are we using the rest of the Atlassian stack? You know, what can we do to um, maybe reevaluate what products we need or who needs access to them? Um, but uh, yeah, 
ServiceNow is always out there. And uh, really we want to do is look at what value it can provide. You know, ServiceNow does a lot. A lot of customers or organizations uh, pay a lot for tools and features they don't use potentially. Um, so uh, Jira Service Manager is great at coexisting. If there's a dedicated ServiceNow implementation of ITSM, well, maybe we can look at doing enterprise service management with uh, Jira Service Manager at a fraction of the cost. Andrew, I want you to chime in on this one too, right? What are you seeing as you move customers over? Um, what are you seeing differently in their implementation when they do move over? And so the, the biggest one to me uh, is similar to another point we made earlier, is that the kind of ease of creation of automations. You know, I have so many ServiceNow customers who we've moved off that have those much more complicated scripting type automations that are hundreds of lines, very hard to maintain. And so taking advantage of Jira's, Jira's GUI-based automation and not only replicating that functionality, improving it, but then reducing the admin time by, by 75% or more is a huge value add for a ton of my customers moving from ServiceNow to Jira. Yeah, I'll, I'll just chime in here too. I hear very often we have a team of X people just managing uh, ServiceNow. And um, what I like to hear is that we have enabled a service management tool that through a governance process has a lot more people who are capable of building, maintaining services, automating more with services, uh, getting reporting and data of, uh, out of it and evolving what you're working on, right? What you're working on today is gonna continue to evolve. Um, you're gonna do acquisitions, you're gonna have departments with different needs, you're gonna create new services. And to me, it's really back to that life cycle that we were talking about earlier that becomes really important um, as we're starting to evaluate which of our tools are legacy and which are modernized are really gonna be resilient for us to improve experience and deliver more for our end users in our business. I wanna thank all of you for uh, staying with us today. Uh, thank you, Andrew and Michael. Uh, thank you, Isos and Atlassian for sponsoring today. Uh, again, I'm Isaac Sokolik. I'm the president of Star CIO. Uh, if you did not have your questions answered, you think of something after the uh, webinar closes, please do reach out to Isos Technology. Uh, you see the phone number over there for help and an info at info, isostech. Uh, dot com uh, email address, please reach out to them and go see their booth at the event. It's coming up pretty soon. So for those of you on Atlassian plat platforms, go visit ISOs at their booth. And uh, I look forward, I'll be on a future webinar. I look forward to seeing you in future webinars with ISOs technology. Thanks again, Andrew and Michael. Thank you. Thank you, everybody.